Welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. My name is Tony. I am a contributing editor here at Anime Feminist. You can find me on Twitter. Well, not really on Twitter anymore, but on various platforms at Poet Pedagogue. And with me are Vry and Peter. Hey, uh, I'm Vry. I'm the daily operations manager here at Anafem. You can find me uh, by going to Blue Sky, where uh, my at is at Writer Vry. And I'm Peter Phobian. I'm a manager of uh, YouTube content and strategy at Crunchyroll, and I'm an editor here at Anime Feminist. I'm on Blue Sky at Peter Phobian. So, we are doing this week, without further ado, um, the beginning of something that I've been pushing for for a while, and I've been, like, dragging the NFM team kicking and screaming towards, which is the beginning of a Monogatari watch-along. Um... Mm. The, in all like I'm only here because I love and respect you, Tony. <laughs> Sorry, carry on. And listen, the the reason I want to talk about this series, um, if I if I can explain, we're probably not going to watch the whole thing because it's a million bajillion episodes long. Um, but we are probably going to watch at the very least through Kizu, and then we'll see where how much further we want to go. Um, this is a show that it's it's definitely a fan service show. But it has weirdly compelling narratives around girlhood and and around, like, surviving abuse and how abuse survivors cope and find community. And I was interested to bring Vry and Peter along on this journey because I wanted, like them, I am encountering this series for the first time as an adult. Many, I think many people encountered Monogatari as children for the first time or as teenagers, but I'm curious what it means to watch Monogatari as adults who are feminist-minded and who are thinking through feminism from a uh, survivor-centered perspective, um, or from any other feminist perspective for that matter. But you know, that's the perspective I come from it from. Um, yeah, I want to know before I give my own thoughts on it. What did you all know about Monogatari before I? dragged you kicking and screaming into this um into this uh watch along um what did you heard about his reputation and and like did it end up living up to that reputation that you had heard like or living down to it for that matter peter you want to go first uh sure i can go first uh so like uh, ever since it first came out it's just i think it's sort of been kind of part of the anime fandom zeitgeist I really, I, it just never, I just never, I don't know, I never felt compelled to watch it, um, especially since the, the fandom is kind of intense, uh, and there have been a couple select scenes that I believe have become kind of representative of the show in its entirety. Oh, uh, Lord, which, yes. Uh, are not great, uh, so that has kind of, you know, I think dissuades the average anime fan uh, who isn't hella into that kind of thing. To, do they uh, involve a toothbrush, uh, Peter? It do, yes, there's a toothbrush involved. So uh, I kind of knew it by that reputation, yes. Um, but I've, I've also heard a ton of good recommendations from it. I actually read the first volume of the manga uh, only because it's uh, illustrated by one of my favorite mangaka, uh, Ogre. So I, I thought that might end up getting me into the series before you brought up the possibility of this podcast. Yeah. Oh, and I also watched... I, I'm like kind of familiar with the effect it's had on the anime light novel and manga industry since i think it sort of created its own subgenre of guy going around solving girls problems that have they have some sort of uh kind of supernatural uh psychological issue that uh if he can resolve some issue of their life it will uh rid them of some sort of like adjacent supernatural uh affliction that is also uh affecting them and in doing so, the girl falls in love with him and he slowly accrues uh, a harem uh, like a bunny girl senpai. I, I have to say, uh, as far as how it's lived up to its reputation, uh, I definitely see a lot of the positive points people have described of it. And uh, it is not so far nearly as uh, the, the, the negative aspects are not as intensely bad as the stuff I've kind of come to expect based on my experience with the subgenre it's created. 
I, I, I pledge, I pledge to Tony before we started this, because I love and respect you uh, <laughs> as a person and a critic. Jeez. I am going to do my level best to give this show that you think highly of a fair shake. Um, and I do come into this with some baggage because I really hate the genre that you described uh, that this popularized, Peter. The uh, boy, the potato boy saves sad girls subgenre yep. because i think i think a lot of the derivatives of monogatari tend to fall into this pattern where it's it's characters who have you know capital letters or excuse me it's women who have deep psychological issues uh capital letters but the only way the these shows conceive them in a very specific way where these girls exist in these isolated psychological like isolated social bubbles that can only be considered interesting because protagonist uh, care, audience insert boy has taken an interest in them. He steps in and magically solves their issues and then they have no further ambition in their life except to fall in love with him a lot of the time. Um, like you said, Bunny Girl Senpai is kind of the most popular right now, Monogatari, Knockoff, Descendant, uh, 18If is a little bit more niche, uh, was another one mm. in the past couple of years. It's it's a genre that really pisses me off because it nods toward paying attention to psychological depth among female characters, but ultimately can only conceive of them in their role as love interests and, you know, thing that a male character can fix in order to you know, get a win outcome that makes them into girlfriend. Uh, and that bothers me because it has the veneer of taking an interest in women, but a sort of a more uh, cynical underpinning to it. And I think one thing that I, even just watching these what eight episodes, one thing I want to say about Bakumonogatari, that was a pronunciation anyway, is that I think if this is sort of a Madoka instance yeah. i mean it is shaft over uh where like monogatari clearly has a lot of bullshit going on but it also has more genuine things going on where these women begin to form community with one another and have uh relationships outside of araragi so i think that i can already see that this is going to be a case where the people who try to chase after bakamonogatari's success uh have increasingly filed off the sort of more nuanced less obvious details of what makes it compelling and come away with a more stock tropified version that I loathe with every fiber of my being. And I also, uh, you mentioned the fandom. That's so what I knew about Monogatari before this, uh, before Tony got really into it is that it's hella horny. Yep. That was most of it. It was hella horny and fans really want you to know that this is the fan service anime. That's deep actually capital letters. Um, and I, I don't think there, people come to shows with deeper themes through a lot of ways, and I think that's great, but I think what bothers me about Monogatari fans is that there is a certain subset of them, the particularly intense ones, and especially in the 2010s, where, who would love to tell you how deep and amazing and incredibly artistic Monogatari is, and they would sooner pull out their own toenails than watch something like Belladonna of Sadness or The Woman Called Fuchiko Mine. Mm. And I, and I, and it's, it's not this, and it's not Monogatari's fault, but I do get really aggravated and annoyed that this kind of fan service centric story, because it has that element to it, gets to have six, seven entries across multiple mediums with these really talented directors who go on to be enormous names in the field. Uh, and we were just talking among ourselves the other day about how conversely, uh, Jose Muke or transgressive queer artworks, you repeatedly see artists disappear off the map for trying to be truly transgressive that way, like Sayo Yamamoto being metaphorically locked in Mappa's basement for the last eight years, or the Dokuse director being nowhere to be found, the fairy Ron Maru artists being really active and enthusiastic on social media immediately after that show aired, and then just vanishing from social media altogether. Like, it's mm -hmm. frustrating to me that, that it's not, I don't think that this show has nothing going on. I don't think it deserves no accolades. I think I, 
in some ways I am bringing some baggage to it because of the factors that allowed it to rise to the height as this sort of iconoclastic auteur uh, piece of genius that it's known as and what shuts other shows and other artists out, you know? And that's not, in some ways, that's just what it's emblematic of and not the show qua show's fault, you know? Yeah, I, I think to what you said earlier about um, the um, the kind of, Bo- uh, girls who have no like real relationships outside of their relationship with the main boy, like in terms of the the things that have come after it, I I really genuinely think that um, a lot of those shows modeled themselves on Bake Monogatari, right? But then didn't do en- learn anything from Monogatari's second season, which is where Araragi is literally written out of the, like seventy percent of the narrative, mm-hmm. and the girls just kind of like get to know each other and like solve their issues together and is really my my person some of my personal favorite parts of it um i also like as for my own like knowledge of the show i i want i first was exposed to monogatari because i had just watched madoka i was really a baby kind of anime fan and i had just watched madoka and i really loved madoka so i was like okay what's what what else has akiyuki shinbo done you know that maybe i would like and so i saw ooh. My, Monogatari, this looks interesting. It's about supernatural things. I turn it on, and the first 10 seconds show, and it is, like, seven seconds of a girl's panties. And I yep. just, I'm like, what the fuck? And I turn it off. And, <laughs> you know, I, and that was my entire impression of Monogatari for, for a while. Um, until... I don't know what possessed me to, like, try to continue watching it. I think I was just, like, very curious because, you know, I, don't, I really have no idea why I, why I decided to turn it back on and keep watching it. But I think the thing about my experience of Monogatari is that, like, for me, it's very much the show that there's certain episodes that just have such profound ideas about the way that we build relationships and the way that we, like manage relationships and cope with trauma and that I've honestly feel like I've learned a lot from in terms of like how I interact with people um which is a crazy thing to say um and then there's other episodes that make me want to gouge my eyes out because I'm just so angry with why the fuck they decided that this was a good idea and that from that roller coaster of emotions is kind of I think the experience like, I don't know about y'all, but I think that's kind of the my experience of watching Monogatari, and I think it's a lot of people's probably experience who have any kind of feminist leanings, you know? Um, speaking of which, um, do we want to talk about kind of like... Yeah, I was... The, what were you going to say, Fry? Oh, no, I was just, uh, like, I was, I was glad you... I was trying right before we recorded to rack my brains about how this all started, because I remember you one day being like, I think I'm going to give this another shot, and I... And I and then it was your life for four months. And I was trying to be like, why did they start this? And I could not remember. It just ate your life one day. Yeah, I think, yeah. And I mean, I've talked on, on podcasts before about, like, I think for me it was, the reason that I kept going is that I watched the first two episodes and I was just so gr- taken by Hitagi's arc um, and Hitagi's experiences. And I felt such a... Re- such a kinship with Hitagi as a character, um, as a fellow survivor of abuse. And I've talked about this on another podcast. Um, I believe our one about, maybe it was about Baldur's Gate 3. Um, but I'm just a huge, uh, characters like that really, like, hit a nerve for me. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Did we want to talk about Hitagi now? Or should we talk about, like, kind of the visual style and what it, like what it's like to kind of first immerse yourself in this show's visual style. I did want to, I, like I had that written down as kind of like, I, one of the reasons that I didn't mention that I was, the show had always been on my list was it was produced by Shaft. And I am definitely one of those people who uh, loves that, that the Shaft style, uh, the Shimbo style. Uh, so I, it was like kind of inevitability that I was going to check it out. Um, and I just kind of, I don't know why, but I just love this bullshit. Um, <laughs> I think it, it's hard to tell at, at certain points. I'm almost like, man, were they limited in their budget, uh, with the way that they cut in and out of just like literally blank screens that has like the name of the color they used. 
or like it almost looks like uh, animation for crying should go here, but they didn't have time for it or something like that. It's very uh, I, I, kind of like daring, uh, especially because at that point this this wasn't established shaft to my knowledge. Uh, so I think uh, they didn't know they could get away with this yet, uh, but they certainly did. Uh, uh, so I, I think it's really great. I can see why somebody would think it's like obnoxious or even like toxic to watch and they don't want to see it, especially if you are not native Japanese speaker and are trying to read subtitles and the screen at the same time when it's flashing walls of text that probably not even Japanese people can take in all at once uh, in the half second that it appears on screen. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of interesting decisions were made and I did like pausing the screen and <laughs> finding out if what was flashing was actually even relevant to what I was watching at all. Um, but I do think it's a kind of an interesting way of trying to uh, create visual interest and incorporate some of the things that the characters are talking about into the screen and what you're watching during some episodes, which are literally just 24 minutes of two characters talking to each other. Uh, so uh, that's very interesting. And I, I do wonder how much Shaft's visual style for this series ended up contributing to kind of like the empty world that a lot of Bakimonogatari's copycats take on, where it's just like nobody seems to exist except the main character and the girls that he runs into and talks to, uh, despite the fact that like hanging out in a park and talking to somebody without running into a single other person is in Japan, Tokyo, is kind of ludicrous. Um, but I, that's something I've definitely noticed from copycats as well. So it, it is interesting to think of how much of it is Shaft's fault because they've also <laughs> done this they have this is like they've done this twice now with Baki Monogatari and Madoka where they just kind of like irrevocably changed the anime fandom uh, so I guess that that's just a bunch of messy stuff I had to say about the visual style <laughs> Visually, I I came around to this by the end of the stretch of episodes we were watching. I find the premiere kind of infuriating, and I had to continually remind myself as we were watching that um, I gotta be real careful what stones I throw, because my favorite uh, live-action American television show is Hannibal, which is full of characters sitting around talking pretentiously at each other. Yeah. And, yes, yes, some of this is my fault, because as a non- as a non-Japanese speaker, I feel sort of inevitably shut out of 10-minute conversations about the radicals that <laughs> characters use in the kanji to spell their names. And like, this is my fault. This is not on Bakemonogatari. This is because I can't follow this and therefore it feels boring. Um, which was sort of interesting to grapple with as someone who's been watching anime for such a long, long time that I feel like I'm used to a lot of the more common wordplay and general conventions, even in more out there shows. But yeah, I, I find the first episode a little bit infuriating infuri in that, to me, good visual trickery is something that you can, even if you have to stop to break it down and get more out of it later, uh, you can sort of at least uh, unconsciously take it in the first time around. Like, you can sort of absorb it as you go. I think the later episodes accomplish that in interesting ways. I I really... My favorite parts of these episodes have been when the show pulls its thumb out and actually gets to the monster of the week, as it were. And then I feel like it really coalesces down into these thematically beautiful moments. Like when it shifts into awkward CGI that really, really works for the crab. Or it has that fantastic um, fight sequence with neon colored blood and uh, rope dope guts. Oh, Vry, you're going to love Kizumonogatari. I... I've told you multiple you times. You've told me this more than once. Vry, you're going to love Kizu. <laughs> like, I just know that that is going to be a, uh, uh, something that tick tickles your interest. Uh, anyways. Yeah. And, like, I e even more broadly, I like, like all of the circular imagery in, in Maioi's arc. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of interesting scenic visuals going on. I, I, I think that the staircase fall that's sort of the romantic oh my meet God, cute I between uh, Hitagi and Araragi is really beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. But I can't truck with the on-screen inner monologue from the, from the books because I think it's... 
I, it is sort of interesting to note that this was just before sort of the advent of streaming for anime. So it's possible it was conceived with the notion of, oh, well, folks will go frame by frame on the DVD. But I don't know. To me, the, uh, a piece of on-screen text that you cannot actually just pause. You can't pause the screen and read these. You have to click, click, frame by frame. And it's really distracting and flashing to the eye and alienating in moments where I'm supposed to be getting feeling more intimate with the characters and I wanted to shake it. Mm -hmm. You see, for me, I actually have come to kind of like that partially because I think that a lot of it is like trying to capture the way that like we don't aren't always fully conscious of our thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, And like they're almost Mm -hmm. subliminal and so like you catch little glimpses of it, but then you're not able to fully like latch onto it. Um, uh, what you were saying, Peter, about like the, the 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 empty world, it's really interesting because the person who really created the visual aesthetic of of Monogatari in general, um, well, there's two people really responsible for the visual aesthetic, at least of this season. Um, Monogatari in general, the visual aesthetic of the backgrounds and of the world itself, is comes from Nobuyuki Takeuchi, who's actually went on to direct Sada Zanmai, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, our our favorite kappa pulling things out your butt show. Um, Love it. I adore it. And so, like, you can see the, the, the trajectory from Bakemonogatari's style when it comes to, like, say, the, the like, the characters who are just, you know, stick figures in um, Sarazamai. And then later on in Monogatari, you're going to see characters who are just kind of represented as these um, uh, construction worker, like, bodies. Um, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. During uh, Kambaru's arc. Yeah. And so, you know, um, the... And then the kind of ways that the these extremely artificial environments, right, um, also I think are reminiscent then of like Sarazanmai and what he'll later do there, or or for that matter, Penguin Drum and his my favorite episode of Penguin Drum, which is uh, he, uh, Himari's backstory arc uh, episode um, in the the Ice Castle, I think it's called. Um, the ice library. Anyways, um, you know it's funny though is that like whenever I've shown this show to somebody, the first time that they watch it, when I show them Bake Monogatari, because like I've learned to show people Kizu Monogatari first because they'll like that. <laughs> mm. um, whenever I show people the premiere of Bake Monogatari, they are always overwhelmed and disoriented and have absolutely no idea what's going on and so confused. But for me, I've watched this premiere about now about like four, four times or five times, and each time I watch it, I grow to love it a little bit more. Um, just there's something about the um, the way that Araragi's perspective is captured um, that I think is just so interesting. I especially love the the conversation at the beginning between him and Hanakawa as you're you get this first person point of view perspective as he's kind of like looking at his pencil to avoid looking at her face while also still looking in her direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got Hanakawa all the time she's in the you're just like, oh man, she's going to have a really big story <laughs> uh, with with all of her. I like her as a character and her interjections. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's used really well, I feel in the first eight episodes. I... Yeah, I like her. Yeah, you, you like her, Bri? <laughs> she strikes me as um, extremely manipulative, affectionate. <laughs> <laughs> compliment in parentheses. <laughs> well, it's funny because in that first conversation, you can catch a glimpse of her, like, trying to undermine Hitagi with 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 Araragi, like, until she catches the, the fact that he likes her, that he likes mm-hmm. Hitagi. Well, actually, because he she catches the fact that he kind of likes Itagi, but before she realizes that his feelings are kind of cemented, right? She's like, oh, yeah, she's a sickly girl, mm-hmm. you know? Like, so she's clearly doing something to try to undermine Hitagi in that first moment. Yep. That cell phone call was great, too. I love bitchy toxic femmes <laughs> and they're well-written. Yeah. Which yeah. is a huge caveat, but... So but sometimes it happens. Can, can definitely say, yeah, uh, if we were uh, to bring the final thoughts uh, way too far forward, I could say I'm looking forward to what, I, I mean, she's going to have a story arc eventually. So uh, whenever that happens, I'm excited for it. Well, I will say, um, if we keep going, we're going to basically, ha- we're going to have three different episodes that are probably going to be devoted to Hanakawa. 
<laughs> if we do what I want to. So we're going to have a lot of time to talk about her. Um, so maybe we should talk about... What were you going to say, right? <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, speaking of, of, of framing and, and Araragi and Hitagi, I think... Uh, it, it is really interesting how often the show likes to just use the top of his head uh, to sort of visually trick the the viewer into a, an unconscious POV shot, which I think is something that a lot of a lot of horny shows try to do. I think we here at Anafem have talked a lot about the you know sort of the delicate dance between making a show that's about a horny character and making a show that's fa- uh that's a fan service show that is the objective eye of you know the third person eye of the camera uh being horny uh, for fans just for fan service purposes and i'm sure uh, i think it wants in some places to do the former but i think it's also just comfortable with the fact that it's doing the latter like i so I, I see what you mean about talking about Hitagi's character as this abuse survivor in abstract, right? Because, you know, she's, I, I think it's interesting that she's developed this sort of really prickly, sort of uh, deliberately antagonistic. Uh, it's not even necessarily a, a front. That's also just kind of what she's like, which I like. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was surprised by how much I kind of like her developing relationship with Araragi. But... I don't know. To me, there's such a difference between the fact that she has become deliberately sort of provocative and weaponized um, being forward with her, with her sexuality um, as sort of this way to have control over herself and her environment and her relationship with others. I think that's really interesting. Um, but, boy, in an era where the, the phrase male gaze has become kind of fraught because... What does gaze mean when more people are making media and more people are behind the camera and, you know, the uh, the industry is no longer quite so lockstep in the presumption that the, the most important viewer is a, a straight, cis, uh, racial majority male like it was when Mulvey was writing her essay. Uh, holy crap, this is just some Mulvey-ass male gaze in that bedroom scene because where where it literally just demem- dismembers visually Hitagi down into her boobs and her thighs and away from her face over and over again except for mm-hmm. the ass slap heard around the world. I did like that one. Are we talking about the um the part where we're talking about uh just to be clear after her shower? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. and it's so frustrating to me. Like, because I think that that statement, that tossed off line she has, which I'm sure, it makes me wonder how, if some of this worked better in the novels, right? Because you don't have that visual element. Like, her line about having trouble choosing clothes because they feel heavy, that, that's really evocative to me in a subtle way of, like, it's becoming much more aware of how you dress yourself and your clothes and the fact that she's at this, uh, dis- she's gone forward living this very constructed life as a way to preserve to protect herself i think that's kind of beautifully subtle writing all of a sudden out of nowhere but yeah yeah the the fan service in that scene i don't think is empowering or her owning her sexuality by taunting him or whatever i think it's so thoroughly undermined by the fact that by by those repetitive fan service cuts that are just Talking and talk, it's it's almost as bad as that infamous Frank Miller um, panel where where Vicky Vale is talking about going on a date with Batman, and it's just focused on her ass the entire time. Mm. Yeah, I didn't even really. I was like, why is this fan service here right now? Because later on in the series, I think it all everything, all the fan service around Central Kara makes sense. Uh, because there's this developing repu- like uh, as you said, she's kind of like weaponized. Uh, the way she interacts with other people, and I, I think that, that like becomes like a weapon in her tool with uh, her. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I'm mixing my metaphors here. It becomes it's kind of like a tool in her kit when she's interacting with Araki because she is actually uh, has this developing attraction to him, uh, and she can sense that he's interested in her as well. Uh, so from that point on, it made sense. But in this scene in the bedroom before the confrontation with the crab. I didn't know why she was even supposed to be doing that. Uh, was it just to throw him off? 
Uh, was it because she was uncomfortable with what she knew was about to happen? Uh, I, I don't like, I can, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to give her the benefit of that and think of an explanation for why it was happening. Uh, although I guess, even though I see intention with the way Senjo Gahara, uh, purposefully uses her body later on, uh, instances around other characters are not as, <laughs> as purposeful. Uh, so maybe I'm just trying to give the series more of a, a benefit of the doubt that it deserves. I'm thinking, like, I, I don't, I can't, I, is there a lot of fan service of her after her arc? Well, I guess not directly, but there is, like, the scene at the train station where yeah. she says she's going to give him a service and she stands over him while wearing a dress. So it's, like, I remember not that. I kind of liked for, that scene. For like, us, that's not actually fan service. That's just, yeah. like, horny flirting. I'm fine mm-hmm. with that. Yeah. But I guess in in regards, from Araragi's perspective, it's her revealing part of her body to entice him. Even though at us as the audience, we did not see it that time, as opposed to the one that to me felt more out of place uh, before she resolved the issue. Like, I think they'd known each other for like two hours at that point, and uh, she was about to go back to get an, a crab exercised out of her. In which case, I'm like, why is she, why is she, what's with all this power play stuff she's doing in her apartment? Well, I think there's a couple of ways of looking at it. For- like, I think on one hand, I, the way I read it originally is that she is because there's multiple points where she implies that she is worried that the ritual that is going to excise the crab is going to be some kind of sexual violence against her. Um, I, I, I think I, and I think on some level she is genuinely she she genuinely thinks that Araragi is sexualizing her because he is right but also like in this very predatory way and i think that she wants to have some amount of control over the way that she is being sexualized i also think though that the show is not necessarily representing that as empowering i think the show is representing that as the coping mechanism of somebody who is hurting um and i think um uh, uh, that is a complicated thing because on one hand, you know, you're, you're seeing this and it is, you're kind of seeing somebody pick at their own wound, right? In that scene. And the question is then like, is, is watching this girl pick at her own wound, right? Or pick at her, you know, scab. Um, is that, and then having that be in itself sexualized, right? Like we're watching a character do something deeply uncomfortable for them and for us, and it's being sexualized. Is that inherently, like, necessarily, like, um, where do you draw the line with that, right? You know, um, because is that, is that sexualizing a girl who's in pain and really should be getting, like, you know, like, you, you get what I'm saying, right? Or is it right. representing yeah. honestly this kind of aspect of how how girls or how people survivors you know cope negatively with their own sexualities after assault? And honestly, like many things in Monica Three, I think it's both. Yeah, I honest to God, watching that um, Hitagi's arc, I I had a moment where I was like. Did Mario Okada watch this arc? Yeah. Is she mad? Yeah. Because, yeah, to me, so much of, um, the of the Hitaki Crab is straightforwardly doing the stuff that the woman called Fujiko Mine is like commenting on in a meta sense, where it's where that series also has like. That, that series goes up to about 15 in terms of having so much nudity that it becomes mundane and trivialized and even sort of annoying um, in a very pointed and deliberate way. I think that, yeah, I think that, I think that you're right. It, this is Hitagi self-harming in that scene. Um, I can totally see where you're coming from from that. I don't think the framing pulls it off. Um, in terms of making it as uncomfortable as maybe it should be because because nobody in this series talks like a person, as it were. It's all very heightened and dramatic um, and, and very hyper real. So I don't think that 
I don't think it necessarily comes off as different from her regular dialogue, right? Um, so instead it just becomes like, oh man, this girl is damaged and that's sad. Mm. And also kind of hot. Mm. It's very interesting watching this show as somebody who has absolutely no attraction to women. <laughs> you know because i'm just like like a lot of that ends up like almost going over my head because i'm just like i'm supposed to find this hot i i don't but okay (laughs) (laughs) um like it does nothing for me as somebody who does who has no attraction to children but i I know how the theory of this works i do think that's a very interesting reading though uh, uh regarding uh self-harm i hadn't thought of that yeah, but it does it kind of yeah it fits in especially when you discover like what the precipitating incident behind her supernatural crab problem was mm. okay uh i i that was the point where i thought okay this isn't i might i might do okay um <laughs> is that i really liked the i like i said sort of uh uh, sort of uh, meanly earlier is when this show pulls its thumb out and actually gets to uh, breaking down the girls' issues and them getting to confront what's going on with them. I think it has so far hit it out of the park every time. And I really liked the photo collage stuff um, in Hitagi's flashback. You know what's so funny, Vry, is that when you were first talking to me about that, right? Like we were talking off air and you were talking about like this broken, dismembered girl imagery which you, you, I thought at the time you were referring to the photo collage stuff because there's an image, right, of a doll that has yeah. been broken into pieces. Yeah, that see, that I think is effective and deliberately alienating and honestly a really respectful way to visualize this experience of a dissociated sexual assault. I like that entire sequence. I think that it's sensitive and interesting and creative and artistic. And it makes me angry that there's all this bullshit that comes before it. Right, but I think the thing is that, like what you were saying earlier, is that th- there's a parallel, right, between the way that the camera is looking at these different parts of her body, right, in that sexualized mm-hmm. scene, and then this dismembered mm-hmm. b- body. Because, like, literally, like, you you re- use the same language to describe both. I'm not trying to play a gotcha here, but I do yeah. think that there's something interesting no, about no, that. No, no, no. Uh-huh. Like, this idea right, that, like, whether, she's... Com- whether it's... She's come to view herself please, please. in terms of these, like, disparate kind of parts of her body that she can then use and, like, you know, kind of try to maintain control. And all, But she's also deeply internalized this sense of being broken into these pieces by her experience. And she kind of needs to put herself back together. Um, I don't know. That's so interesting, actually. <laughs> no, it is. Like, and it's, I think... I guess, like, it is interesting, and it is there, and maybe it's the cynic in me that thinks that uh, the average Bakemonogatari viewer of the era wouldn't have picked up on that, uh, or necessarily cared. Um, And maybe it's the cynic in me that said, this is the show that, in another episode, is going to create a continuity error just so it can show me a grade schooler's panties. Speaking of which... Should we talk about my yoi? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Let's get it over with. Uh, Again, I, uh, I I do want to say, before I get really angry, I do like the last scene of her arc. I think it's sweet. Oh. I, I think the confrontation scene is sweet. <laughs> Me too. My yois or uh, my yoi. Central Harris. Oh, okay. My yeah, yeah. yeah. I like the conclusion. <laughs> 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 I like when it was over. <laughs> My uh, I, I, like it, it was uh, some uh, tragic stuff. I honestly, <laughs> I, when he gets in the argument with her, and then they it just devolves into a fist fight, and he's standing over her, going like, uh, "Yeah, you fucking idiot for fighting me. Of course I'd win. I'm like the ultimate fighter or something." <laughs> After he just beat up a school kid, I thought that was gen- the way it was framed. Was I thought it was genuinely funny. If they just hadn't also had him molest her over the course of the fight, I thought that would have been a very funny scene. Uh, I it's yeah, just, honestly, and same. it served. It didn't do anything. The ho- the horniness towards children in Monogatari does nothing thematically Mm -hmm. or anything why it makes me so mad because it Mm -hmm. contributes absolutely nothing thematically to the show yeah except for maybe to uh um sorry sorry nadeko's arc 
there it's actually interesting, but everywhere else it is just completely thematically dead to me. Like there's no reason it has yeah. to be there. Yeah, there's the there's the line early uh, in the first uh, Mayoi episode where uh, Araragi talks about how uh, cis con stuff is just made to appeal to dudes who've never actually had a real sister. And I'd love to give that line some credit, but I've heard about the toothbrush scene, Tony. I've heard about the toothbrush scene. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. It, you're, it, we will get to Nisei at some point if we get to it, <laughs> and I am not looking forward to it. Oh God! Yeah. Do we do we kind of want to skim over her so we have more time to talk about the better character who's better in the last twenty minutes here? Yeah, I mean the thing is there's not a lot to talk about with Mayoi because frankly Same. her the the really meaty stuff with Mayoi only comes when she starts being a side character in other arcs. Yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like that that arc honestly did form more for me in kind of developing Hanakawa and uh, the relationship between Araragi and Senju Gahara more than anything with Mayoi herself. Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. I was surprised it was so long, but yeah, definitely Kambaru I think is uh, the most important story arc. I want to know, Vrai, what do you think of Kanbaru? We have not talked about this at all. I have no idea what you think, and you must tell me. Hey, Tony. <laughs> Tony, did this show make the predatory lesbian a pedophile? Tony, did it do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, say more about that. <laughs> or do you want me to answer the question? <laughs> no, I want you to answer the question and then we can talk some more. <laughs> they certainly didn't make... I. It's like... She's certainly nowhere near as, like, predatory as Araragi is. <laughs> yeah, the bar is in hell. That's yeah. true. <laughs> no, but, yeah, um... So, yeah, other than uh, getting really, really fucking pissed about her casually uh, creeping on the tiny background vampire, who I'm sure will be important later, um, because fuck you, Nishio Isen. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Um... Yeah, no, I like her. Um, I think, I also think that it's, um, I, I was also a little bit like, fuck you, you haven't earned the right to use Utena's stretch. Mm. Like, you're, get off that level, you're not on it. Get off. Mm. Out. Like, the way that, the way that Kambaru stretches is, like, pulled directly from Utena? Yeah, that's her, like, uh, her, her idol animation if you will you know when she's just sort of talking to characters and she oh, yes. does that like puts her hands on her knees and stretches out to either yes, side yes, that's yes. totally utena's thing oh yes um but no i think it's it's sort of um it's an interesting um thing to be watching this like the season after i'm in love with the villain is aired right because mm. that show is messy that that whole that novel is messy but it's written by a trans lesbian right Right. Uh, trying to do a thing intimately about this issue of predatory lesbians in in anime and it's and i don't know i i have a certain amount of uh deep compassion for that even as i get sort of frustrated with the really frustrated with the early parts of that series and then on the flip side i think that I do think that this series is doing so, a few interesting things with Kambaru in terms of how it wants to address the fact that the whole, I just want to be, um, you know, I'm just happy if I can be near you and we don't interact at all. And I'm definitely happy being unrequited and like over here is some bullshit mm-hmm. that no real teenager has ever thought mm-hmm. like that. I was on with. And also I laughed really hard when she was like, I'm a lesbian. Oh, you're a man. Hold on. Let me rephrase this for you. I'm a Yuri. <laughs> I laughed <laughs> fucking hard. Mm-hmm. Um, although, but also I don't appreciate the fan service getting in on it again where it's like okay so this character has explicitly said that she's a lesbian and she used she's used the term les which is was pretty much the community term uh in japan like marked out for you know but she's still gonna f- she's still gonna try to flirt with araragi though yeah and, oh like, my god that fucking maybe scene. maybe you can see it as her secretly testing 
his devotion to Hitagi. Mm-hmm. But the... Listen, I like chasing Amy as much as the next guy, but this is somebody who's loudly said that she is not interested in men, but we do still need to have our harem protagonist uh, have another woman throw herself at him, though. Are we do need an shorts, excuse for that. Do those qualify as underwear? You see, I did laugh at that section. I, I You see, mm-hmm. I those are the moments with Kanbaru that I really love. I love... I actually really love her, like... She has kind of this... Um, well, we'll talk about it more later, but a lot of her dynamic with Adaragi is, am I more perverted or are you more perverted? Let's have a competition. And I honestly kind of enjoy that a lot, actually. A lot of the jokes in those arcs honestly feel like they were written for me specifically. Um, because a lot I of could, it... I could get behind that. I think it was just writing on the conversation where she was... Uh, I think it was before or directly after the one where she basically said, like, well, if, you know, uh, I'll just let you have sex with me and then you don't need to get anywhere near Centro Gahara. That was a weird moment. Like, even, like, yeah, on specific, rewatch, yeah. I didn't quite... That... I still don't quite understand that moment because, you know, like... We'll talk about more about her character moving forward because, you know, the, there's a lot going on there. But that moment... Mm. I feel like I feel like we're gonna need to. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, what was y'all's impression of that moment? <laughs> yeah, I, I hated it. Uh, mm. That's that is specifically the moment I was talking about when I was like, we have to have the lesbian throw herself at our character just to show how massively dick swinging he is. Even though, mm-hmm. again, I think Araragi is more complex than a lot of mm-hmm. horn dog protagonists. Like that still feels like it fell into that for me. Honestly, mm. the bike sort shorts convo i kind of liked because the fan service the the butt shots felt more silly and i liked them racing around uh fucking about with each other like i can get behind that but yeah it is a little Mm. bit tainted by that moment Mm. to me yeah i feel like the at least i I felt like i could interpret a purpose behind it which was either yeah she was testing him or to kind of begin to build this sort of uh unreliable narration uh, that she had around herself since she had said oh yeah i've, I've kind of determined where i'm at with this i, I want to respect central power's boundaries mm-hmm. um uh i'm i'm in this unfortunate situation and then you kind of learn that uh, uh what she's saying is not really the truth of how she feels mm-hmm. uh so i think it was supposed to tie into that but yeah of course it had to be in the context of her offering sex to the main character i i think one thing that i really appreciate about monogatari in general is that it's really interested in the 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 deep discontinuity between the lies that we have to tell ourselves to re- remain in good standing with the people who we care about and then the reality of our messy mm-hmm. feelings yeah um, i did i i think that was one of my favorite things about combo arc where they're just like well you actually just kind of wanted to beat him to death didn't you <laughs> and i was like oh well and I, I, I also thought it was really cool about Rocky to go like I can, I can empathize with that. I can, I, I, who hasn't felt that yeah. way at one point in their life? I'm like, damn, respect. I think that's. Part I, of I the music. Was, I think. Go ahead. No, no, please, you go ahead. I think that's My, part of what I, I'm going to go off in a direction. I think that's mm-hmm. part of what makes me a little bit more okay with the kind of predatory lesbian kind of like contours of her arc, because I think that. In, in in many ways, the arc is trying to, like, not necessarily deconstruct the predatory lesson, because I really hate that term, deconstruct, because I, I think oftentimes it's kind of overused and silly nowadays. Mm-hmm. But I think it is trying to, like, question, like, okay, so there's people who, you know, have crushes that are really hard. Um, and I think that, like, instead of being the thing that, like, is removing the nuance from her storyline is actually the thing that helps cre- add more nuance to the storyline. Um, I don't know. It, it, I, I, I'll, I'll get more into that later because I, I want to talk a little bit about like the chop off the arm scene because I think that's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but what were you going to say, Vry? Um, Well, I do. Th- yeah, I, I think mm. I will say that there have been, there are moments in all of these episodes where I feel like just uh, these powerful moments of empathy with these female characters and like it uh when hitagi is sort of just just sort of crying about her mom um and then with uh kanbaru when 
she's just sort of venting this anger that she would have she would have done everything Araragi did, mm. but she doesn't have a dick though, mm. so doesn't count. Mm. And I was like, "Oh, girl, let me hug you, you sweet dumb fuck." <laughs> um, but uh, as an aside, uh, speaking of why that scene about her uh, offering to have sex with uh, Araragi is in there, I feel like it says something about the average Monogatari. Um, viewer that the wikipedia entry uh, with the character sections describes kanbaru as an as an admitted lesbian uh, <laughs> why admitted <laughs> like I, oh my lord it does, i thought, I did, I thought I there will... was going to be something like uh well she said she's a lesbian but she also offered araragi sex meaning she's more likely to be bisexual listen no i w- would you like me to read the full sentence because uh, it's she's an admitted lesbian although okay. jokingly desires to be uh koyomi's mistress if he ever gets married mm. oh my lord <laughs> <sighs> God, well, well, we'll we'll get there um, in a few episodes, I'm sure. I will give this a um, a modicum of credit in that because it was 2009 and this is a fan service anime made for men, I did kind of expect to be waiting around for episode three for it to reveal she was Thunderbolt, a lesbian. No, it it, um, because that was the style of the time. (laughs) Um. But it, it the fact so it gets it gets a few respect points for me that it kind of tidied away that point in episode at the beginning of episode two and kind of moved forward with it, yeah. you know. I am in love with your girlfriend, bro, and I kinda wanna kill you. Who can't relate? <laughs> yeah. 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 But yeah, the the arm scene. I find that scene really interesting. I mean, my interpretation of it is that like her wanting to chop off her arm is like largely due to internalized homophobia right Mm -hmm. and this like being like not kind of similar to senjo gahara want like asking the the crab to take away her her weight like kambaru Mm -hmm. wants to like take away this like level of desire that she has for senjo gahara right and Mm -hmm. and whatever jealousy that she feels towards araraki rather than actually dealing with it and I think one thing that I really appreciate, and she also just lies to herself, right? That she doesn't care about Sandra Gahara, right? Or that she's over it, right? And that's mm-hmm. such an obvious lie. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. Just, yeah. Um, so I'm curious mm-hmm. what y'all no. made of that moment. Yeah, I think the, the it, there's a, it, there is an interesting level to, uh, to her to kanbaru and the way that she plays off hitagi in some ways it's like man it's gotta suck having a crush on a girl like hitagi oh my god because she's kind of mean like i really like her and there's a, and i have incredible compassion for the way she is but holy shit if you're not like the person singular she's decided she's wants to invest emotionally and in, you're gonna have a bad time Mm. And that's really hard when you're also like a teenage girl struggling with your own, your own feelings and your own mess. And the fact that she's, I, I, she gives me the feeling that she always wanted to be a good girl. You know, mm. she's got a dead mom and she's like the standout star athlete who, who seems to be well regarded by her classmates. And so she just stuffs all these negative feelings down until she, she hasn't, she doesn't just blow off some steam when she has a bad day and gets frustrated she stuffs it down until she wants to beat her classmates to death and i'm like oh girl i relate to you i i guess i, I hadn't thought of the arm chopping scene in that perspective i think it was it was kind of to show I, I i didn't know if it was really necessary but that she has these really dark feelings uh wit and the show is absolutely trying to sympathize her and show that those feelings don't determine what sort of person that she actually is because at the end of the day, she did say, well, I'd rather cut my arm off if it means I, like, if keeping this arm means I'm going to harm someone else. Mm. Uh, so I, I think it was sort of trying to establish her actual moral position mm. uh, or, like, her, her, her true morality as opposed to 
uh, unavoidable feelings that we, not just her, but all of us experience. It, she wasn't experiencing, she didn't want to be Aradagi to death because she's a bad person. It's just because she is a person who's experiencing feelings uh, that she would really like to not be feeling. Yeah, and it's, um, it's like, it, she seems to, it's not spoken, but I think you can read I don't think necessarily that the show is entirely going here, but I think it is within the scope of the ambiguity of what it's set up, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, this idea that she she is painfully aware that there is this idea uh, of, you know, she's a teenage girl who would have grown up in the 90s, uh, if, if this is set contemporarily to when it was made. Uh, she grew up in the 90s and the early 2000s. She knows that the only lesbians she sees in her manga are predators. So Mm -hmm. she better fucking not show any violent or negative feelings and she better stand off here to the side, even though she hates it and it sucks. And also she genuinely really doesn't, she really does want to, to do the thing that we all know we're supposed to do, which is when somebody turns you down, you respect their wishes and you don't go near them because you care about them as a person and you want to respect their boundaries, but also you're so full of feelings and it sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I thought she was definitely the most, uh, like, uh, her her arc was the most interesting to me of the, the three. Um, or at least maybe the most easy for the average person to empathize with. I mean, not that my, my voice is <laughs> weird, but, uh, yeah, I, I liked Kanbaru a lot. I was just going to ask you, y'all, the kind of way that the, the ending of it, where Sanjo Gohara just kind of, confronts Kambaru and confronts Kambaru's mm-hmm. emotions. Like I really like that scene. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does I I'm going to trust you that it's going to go forward from here, right? Um because I don't know, to me it's like I want to read it positively as like they've sort of cleared the air um and she got to confess and uh Hitagi got to turn her down and so that kind of clears the air as it were it kind of reminded me of the last uh episode of oh maidens uh in your savage season which mm. is a good anime that people should watch um but so i want to believe that this is going to give them a chance to have closure and genuinely be f- friends and not lock kanbaru into the position she was trying to avoid in the first place which was sort of uh trying to be friends but actually just pining from afar <laughs> I, the whole the structure around the story arc was kind of, especially Sandra Gara's role in it was pretty interesting to me because uh, when Kambar is first brought up, she threatens to stab Aradagi's eye out as if he's like uh, looking at other women when she already knew that Kambar was a lesbian. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know why she got super defensive about it. I, I feel like she definitely should have known also that uh, Kambar was the one who assaulted him on the at train station. It didn't seem like she was deceived uh that he had uh just crashed his bike uh, considering his bike was like wrapped around a fucking building um so it felt strange to me that uh well I, I, especially because he lied to her after explicitly saying i don't want us to lie to each other um it ended up wrapping around kind of nicely in the end with her uh sort of showing up as the only one who could possibly resolve this situation Mm. Uh, so uh, I, you know, I appreciated that Araragi was trying to solve the problem himself, and it turned out that was impossible, uh, and that she uh, said, basically, yeah, you getting beaten to death is kind of your comeuppance for lying to me in the first place. Um, and just the <laughs> way that it stru- structured all of these promises. Uh, yeah, I really like uh, You should die 10,000 times, but yeah, she basically killed you 10,000 times. Um, but the way all the, 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 the wishes and promises is sort of structured itself, Sen Shogahara being... It being revealed that she was aware of the situation sort of made it impossible uh, for the demon possessing Kambaru's arm to take action against uh, Araragi and therefore kind of broke the contract. Uh, so I, I thought that like was narratively pretty elegant, uh, whereas before I kind of did not like that Sandra Gahara had gotten weirdly eliminated from the story. So all that I, I felt was great. But yeah, in the end... It's just like, it, it, are we just stuck in the situation where Kambaru, all, all she, is she gets to be near Sancho Gahara like she wanted, but not in the way that would actually deliver any sort of catharsis or satisfaction. I did think it was nice that Sancho Gahara was like, no, I see you. Um, and maybe this does mean that they can be closer, because before that, their last interaction had just been Sancho Gahara saying, 
like never fucking talk to me again now that you know my secret. Um, mm. So the clearing the air was nice, but yeah, as, as Bryce said, that that was kind of the impression that I was left with was, uh, so is she just going to be the the pining lesbian for the rest of the series or not? Well, you all will find out. Um, <laughs> oh, great. God. Thanks for uh, uh, resolving all of our concerns. I will not say <laughs> anything. Um, okay. I will say that I so, really do like Kanbaru as a character. Like, over the yeah, course of the great. whole show, she's fantastic. And she is... Like, I, I one day, like, towards the end of the podcast, I will do a... You know, towards the end of our uh, watch-along, I will do a tier list of... I think we can all do a tier list of our um, Monogatari side characters. And... Um, who we think is f- a fun time and who we think is not a fun time. <laughs> um, I'd like that. That sounds fun. Yeah. Um, there, are, I, there are definitely concerns that y'all had about the show that I've had to keep silent about because I have thoughts and we will f- find out about them. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think that just about wraps us up for this, um, for this watch along. Um, does it, do y'all have any final thoughts before we, um, close us out. I will say as, um, I, the kind of last thought is aside from the shit with Maoi, where I started to go, Oh no, I see it now. Um, I'm surprised by how much I did not hate Araragi as much as I was prepared to, <laughs> because the other, besides this show is horny. The other thing that it's, that's known about it is, uh, the main character should be in jail, which uh, I'd say he's earned. Uh, just for the Mayoi stuff. But other than that, I sort of... I, like I said, I, I like that he and Hitagi sort of actually talk to each other. And I see why they have this sort of fledgling developing relationship where they're both awkward. Um, I like their dynamic, which really surprised me, honestly. And I, I kind of like that the show seems aware of the issues of this sort of savior complex he has. Which, again, is not a thing that some of the its later knockoffs have. So, yeah. I just wanted to give him that tentative thumbs up, except for the pedophilia. <laughs> let me just put a wish into the atmosphere where I say... <laughs> let, let me put a wish into the atmosphere where I say, I hope Kanbru gets a girlfriend of appropriate age. Okay, I'm done. Hmm. Uh, well, how do I follow that up? Uh, I already mentioned this, but yeah, I, I, uh, since we sort of skipped over the Mayo arc where uh, this kind of, a lot of that stuff happened with Sandra Hara, I, I also really like uh, the relationship between her and Araragi, uh, specifically, and the way that uh, she kind of initially approached him and uh, eventually changed strategies over the course of the Mayo arc. I, I think Sandra Hara is a great character. Uh, I really like uh, the way she communicates and interacts with other people, and yeah, as Bryce said, I'm I am more invested than I thought I would be in their relationship for sure. Uh, so definitely like uh, uh, a lot of surprises into how um, what do you call it? Um, kind of fun and interesting a lot of the characters are, and how invested I am actually in maybe some of the relationships. So that's been a pleasant surprise. All right. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to talking. To, I'm not necessarily looking forward to watching all of this, but I am looking forward to talking about it with you. Yes, it it's very fun getting to get another perspective on this show. Um, and and I th- I think it's gonna. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I think it's gonna end up like Kill a Kill, where that show pissed me off from basically beginning to end. But in retrospect, I have a lot of fondness for a lot of the characters and uh, the more the the bits of it that were more successful. <laughs> Yeah, um, even even if we don't finish the whole show, Rai, I would like you to watch Hana Monogatari, which is Kanbaru's, like, the arc that she narrates, that she has five episodes that are really just kind of about her. Um, Hell yeah. I think, I think you'll sold. be <laughs> What? Already sold. Already sold. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, I, it really bums me out that, like, that second season, I think, is really where the show starts to escape Araragi's perspective, and we really, really get the girls' um, like point of view for a while, because I really think that that's the arcs that y'all would get so much out of. But unfortunately, but I mean, not it's unfortunately. Just to hear that they have periods where they interact a lot, because um, I, I may be wrong I, or incorrectly remembering Bunny Girl Senpai, but it doesn't really feel like a lot of his various 
uh, the girls that he interacts with interact with each other. They just all sort of exist in isolation. Uh, and I think this is true of a lot of the copycats. So the fact that they can exist together without Aragi present, uh, <laughs> is, it, it, that's encouraging in and of itself. It's like the Bechtel test as a... Yeah, yeah I, was gonna, like, I was trying to not say the Bechtel uh, test. <laughs> a, 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 a rule of the universe in some of these shows. Like, you, the show must fail the Bechtel test. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's actually... Uh, the second season, Aragi's put on a bus, and it's just the girls talking to each other and having a good time for a lot of it, so... I, oh, yeah. I I I really do look forward to talking at least a little bit about the second season with y'all if y'all stay, stick with it. Um, if folks want us to, um, I I will watch the rest of it. Probably we'll end up taking a break for because you know just for the folks who don't want ten straight episodes of Monogatari, but. I will say right now that if folks are interested in these discussions, I will watch as much as, as y'all want to hear about. So let us know what you think. Um, all right. Uh, this has been Chatty AF, the Anime Feminist Podcast. If you liked what you heard, make sure to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps us to um, get you know the word out. And if you really liked what you heard, make sure to um, share um, our podcast on social media and give us um, a buck or two on Patreon. Um, if you pay $5, you can join our Discord and get access to our bonus episodes, which are really fun. You can hear... Um, I don't remember what our most recent bonus episode was. What will what, we talk about on last? Well, you can hear Tony talk about uh, talk about Monogatari more and also Baldur's Gate 3. Yes. Um, you can hear that stuff um, and lots of other stuff. Um, and, uh, we are on, um, we are on various social media sites. Um, you can look at our link tree to find all of them. It is L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash anime feminist. Yes. So go there and you will find all of the different sites that we're on, all of our articles, our Patreon, and anything that you could want including our shop link where you can buy merch so uh with that uh thank you